Good morning, my sisters and brothers. It is a great joy to be here with you, to be in the presence of your wonderful president and Mrs. Blount, and to be in the presence of my dear sister, the great Katie Geneva Cannon. As I look out at you, it is a joy to see so many people that I know. I want to make make special mention of one wonderful brother who's here, who's not far, who lives not far from here, the Reverend Adam Bond, who is a professor over at Virginia Union, a fabulous, fabulous scholar and a wonderful administrator. And I'm just so glad that he is he is here with us. My friends, in uh, 1984. <coughs> I was a senior at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was a religion and theology major there, and I was being introduced to some of the great theological minds of the Christian tradition. John Calvin, I was working through Calvin within the Dutch tradition, Hermann Bavink and Durever and Burkhoff and Burkhauer. Those of you who are not Dutch, you may not know these names. Um, <laughs> Carl Bard and Bruner and Schleiermacher. I was being introduced to the th great theological tradition. In the spring of my senior year, I was on a field trip to Atlanta, Georgia with a group of students to hear a young theologian by the name of James Hal Cohn. He was speaking at this black Mennonite conference. Yes, there are black Mennonites. Black <laughs> Mennonite conference. And um, this, this skinny man with this afro walked in. He leaned into the microphone, and with this high-pitched, beautiful voice, he, he laid into us. <laughs> he laid into us in ways that were absolutely stunning. He had just finished a book called For My People. And in that, in that lecture, he reflected on some of the things from that book. And I sat there as a young theologian wannabe, and I listened to this man, and I said, this is it. This is the direction. He is speaking a truth that I had not heard. And from that moment forward, becoming a theologian was not just a possibility for me, it was a necessity. As I said last night, I would like to dedicate these lectures in the memory of the Reverend Dr. James Hal Cohn and in honor of my great sister great sister, Dr. Cannon. So dear friends, yesterday, in our first lecture, I introduced you to the sickness plaguing Christian doctrines of creation and the geographic and racial wounds formed in the world due to that sickness. We ended that lecture by pointing to the tragic ways Christians read the world and read scripture, imagining land first and foremost as private property, private property, a word that should not easily come off our lips. Private property, silent, still, and waiting for our cultivation. It is the connection between possession and cultivation that I want us to consider this morning, the relation between possession and cultivation. We have been taught, as I said last night, to look out onto the world through a hermeneutics of possession that slices the world up into fragments and renders the first question to be one of ownership. Who 
owns the land. Who owns the land? What individual, what people, which nation? Indeed, nationalism comes to life inside the possessive logics of land. In our third lecture, we will consider the problem of nationalist ways of looking at the world for a doctrine of creation. Because what destroys a doctrine of creation more than anything else are nationalist ways of looking at land. But this morning, the crucial idea, the crucial word to consider is cultivation. That is, moving something, moving anything, a person or a people or a world to maturity. The problem we face, my friends, is that our hermeneutics of possession has distorted the way we understand cultivation and has given birth to horrific visions of maturity bound to whiteness. At the end of my first lecture, I pointed to the life of Jesus as the life that may, if we allow his life, overturn, overturn our hermeneutics of possession and give back to us, give back to us a world alive, reciprocal, and seeking to speak through us of the glory of God. So after exploring the problem of cultivation and maturity, I will return to the life of Jesus once again, always coming back to the life of Jesus, as the way we might restore, restore a sense of cultivation and maturity that does not destroy, but that heals us. So, the question we have to think about very slowly and carefully. Why has God given this new world to us? Why has God given this new world to us? This was a question asked by generations of Euro-Christian colonial settlers coming to the new world. This was their question. Why has God given this new world to us? They found themselves not only in environments, the character of which were beyond immediate explanation, but they also found themselves with power over peoples and lands that was equally inexplicable unless one has a doctrine of providence. <laughs> yeah. You see, this doctrine, this doctrine, help us, Lord, this doctrine, since the beginning of colonial modernity, let's call it that, colonial modernity, has had a shadowy and profoundly demonic side to it. The doctrine has been rendered demonic. The Christian settlers deployed the doctrine of providence to explain their presence, their power, and especially their license to do with the new worlds as they saw fit. God had given the new worlds into their hands. How else could they understand it? God had given the new world into their hands. The colonialists entered the new worlds utterly convinced that they were the people God ordained the task to cultivate the new world, to bring it to full maturity. But what, what does maturity look like? What does maturity of mind and body, of land and animal use, of landscape and building, of family and government. What does maturity look like? The colonialist drew the answer to that question, should I say those questions, solely from their own lives and their own bodies. Whiteness 
emerged as a horrific answer to that question. A question formed exactly at the site of Christian missions. To speak of whiteness, to speak of whiteness, my sisters and brothers, is not to speak of particular people, but of people caught up in a deformed building project aimed at bringing the world to its full maturity. You must let that sit with you. People caught up in a deformed building project aimed at bringing the world to its full maturity. Whiteness was from its beginning a deformed, a deformed formation toward maturity. This deformed formation toward maturity functioned like a jealous God, allowing no other visions of maturity to exist in its presence. You see, colonialists destroyed the visions of maturity of so many peoples by destroying the connection of those visions to land and animals. Every people, every people have a process of becoming. <clears throat> becoming adult, becoming leader, entering one's calling, one's vocation, if you will. And all of this is made visible by their life in the land. So the children become the young. Then the young become the leaders of their people. Then they become the elders that guide. Then they become the stories that are told. Then they join the eternal presence that covers the ground and surrounds the people. The ancestors, the ancestors speak from the ground move through the wind and sky, are felt in the rain. They sound with the animals. From the ground we come, and to the ground we will return. Yeah, we've heard that before. For so, for so many people, the quality and character of a life is calibrated by the movement from, through, and to the earth. For so many people of the world, that becoming, that becoming adult, becoming elder, that becoming requires the earth, the ground, water, sky, animals, days and seasons, snow and rain, sun and heat, morning and evening, stones, mountains, trees, forests, streams, rivers, that becoming requires all of them. How else would you know that you have become? Unless the world echoed back to you, you're becoming. How else would you know? The becoming they lived moved in and out of all of these things and more. But if all these things and more are taken away if land and animal, earth and sky as they knew it are taken away, how will they become? How will they become? Become fully aware, become fully alive, become fully mature, fully attuned to the wisdom of one's people. You see, the Christian settlers had an answer to that question because they knew what all indigenous peoples needed to become, Christian and civilized, marked by a salvific progress. The most important thing in the world in this Christianized way of thinking is to allow yourself to be moved toward maturity. And it is precisely this commitment to a life aimed at maturity, 
aimed at maturity, the joined visions of salvation, visions of salvation to ideas of the transformation of lands and peoples, and together formed visions of Christian mission. Whiteness formed at this joining. Stay with me now. Whiteness formed at this joining. From the beginning of colonialism, salvation and transformation of land and peoples have been coupled together. And that coupling turned Christianity's creative powers against itself. Christian faith is about new life in Christ and forming life inside that newness, forming life inside that newness. Now the new situation of colonial power enfolded that newness, enfolded the newness itself. That is, Christian faith within the newness that was the transformation of land, people, earth, and animals. It took the newness of Christian faith and dropped it inside the newness of turning land into private property and turning indigenous peoples into properly civilized Christians. So we need precision here to see the problem, sisters and brothers. <coughs> precision to see the problem. The problem is not that things change. Don't misunderstand me. The problem is not that things change. Things change. We could even say, carefully, we could even say that things evolve. We could say that, but carefully. <laughs> carefully, very carefully. Nor is the problem the impulse to transform. Transformation is not inherently evil. Transformation is not inherently evil. The horror here, the horror here, is the denial of the voice and vision, the voice and vision of people who inhabit place. The horror here is the denial of the basic wisdom of peoples that should shape change and transformation. The horror here is the emergence of a form of creating that destroys creation. This is not, this is not the logic of breaking eggs to make omelets. That is, recognizing that some destruction, some destruction is always inherent in creation. That is true. Some destruction is always inherent in creation. But that's not what we're talking about. The logic of this trajectory, the logic of this trajectory destroys the life of chickens by distorting their bodies to maximize egg production. It drives creation and processes of creating toward death. It drives processes of creating toward death. This trajectory of transformation captured the energy and logic of Christian conversion and placed it inside whiteness as a formation toward maturity. Now, if you have not followed this, let me state it clearly. No one is born white. Listen very carefully. <laughs> no one is born white. There is no white biology. <clears throat> there is no white biology. Sometimes you have to say these things three times. There is no white <laughs> biology. But whiteness is real. Whiteness is a working, a working, a forming toward a maturity that destroys. Whiteness is an invitation to a form of agency 
and a subjectivity that imagines life progressing toward what is in fact a diseased understanding of maturity. A maturity that invites us to evaluate the entire world, evaluate the entire world by how far along it is toward this goal. It is not easy to understand whiteness in this way because whiteness has for the most part been presented as a stable racial state. A stable racial state. Even for some people as a part of creation. But we will never be able to grasp the power of whiteness until we see it as a quest, a quest for a death-dealing maturity. The goal of that maturity formed around three points of desired transformation. Three points of desired transformation. First, from being raw material to being an owner. From being raw material to being an owner. Second, from being a stranger to being a citizen. From being a stranger to being a citizen. And third, from being identified with darkness to being seen as honorably white. From being identified with darkness to being seen as honorably white. Now in order to understand what I'm about to say, you must capture this one single truth, that there was a time in this world when no one would have called themselves white. And there came a moment in this world when many people imagined it an achievement to call themselves white. So let's come back. I want to briefly consider these three points of desired transformation. First, from raw material to ownership. From raw material to ownership. Everyone who entered the new world, the new worlds, entered a world of raw material. <clears throat> you were not only surrounded by raw material, but in most cases, you needed to see yourself as raw material. The first desired, excuse me, you had to see yourself as raw material, especially if your purpose in coming to the new world was to make yourself new. The first desired transformation was to move yourself from being raw material to being an owner. Whether we are talking about indentured servants or slaves, labor formed in the new world as first a sacrifice of the body, an offering up of the body. The well-being of the body was never a central part of the calculus of work. Work as survival, yes. Work bound to well-being and flourishing, no. You are just raw material, working your way to becoming something else. There was flourishing life. There was flourishing life but it was reserved for ownership. Moving from being raw material to being property, to owning property and labor meant you would move from being one without voice to one with some measure of voice in society. Owning land meant you could claim, you could claim a masculinity 
intricately woven with nationalist ideologies of freedom and self-determination. To own land, to own your labor, was to own yourself. Which brings me to the next desired transformation, from stranger to citizen. To be a stranger is to live in vulnerability, subject to isolation and violence, and clothed in suspicion. No immigrant from the very first immigrants to this country, no immigrant ever wanted to be a stranger. The second desired transformation was to move yourself as quickly as possible from stranger to citizen. Immigrants transform. Immigrants transform. Not always quickly, almost never uniformly, but all aim at the no longer. All aim at the no longer of never again being in the position of stranger. Coming to the new worlds as an immigrant, especially the place we would come to call the United States, meant you were willing, you were willing to tame the wilderness. Mm. You were willing to tame the wilderness, which was much more than clearing the land. Hmm. It meant you were willing to tame the wilderness around you, but also in you. You were willing to place your body in the unfolding drama of destroying native inhabitants. You were willing to kill, to become new. You were also willing to strip away your immigrant past, that is, those cultural artifacts your name, your voice, your dress, your manner, your comportment, your moods, strip away those cultural artifacts that signaled indebtedness to the old country and the old cultural ways. What would not be destroyed must be concealed. What would not be destroyed must be concealed. Karen Boykin, in her wonderful book, How Jews Became White, tells the story that you could, you could understand the change of an immigrant community by what happened with grandmother. You see, in the, in the first generations, when you came to the house, grandmother would be on the porch there to greet you, speaking in the, native, the, old, the tongue of the old world. The next generation, grandmother would probably be in the foyer or in the living room there to greet you, speaking in the old tongue. In the next generation, grandmother was in the kitchen. And before you left the house in the evening, you stopped in the kitchen to say hello to grandmother until we, come, we came to the final generation, in which grandmother was in the back room and told, do not come out because your English is not good. And of course, there was no visit to the back room to see grandmother. Transformation, transformation. What could not be destroyed must be concealed. Immigrants conceal, not always quickly, almost never uniformly, but all aim at dismissing that for which they might be dismissed or determined to be barbarians inside the gate. Those inappropriate, inappropriate to this new national space. Which brings me to the third transformation. From darkness to honorably white. And we have to return to work to understand this. You see, work transforms and labor ennobles. This is what colonial settlers in multiple ways imagine for themselves and for their native subjects. Work transforms, labor ennobles. 
They imagined a moral transformation at work in and through the work of transforming the new world. The third desire transformation was to move oneself through one's labor toward being honorably white. Such a movement captured the bodies and labor of all workers, drawing them toward a racialized vision of the morality of work. I'll say that again. A racialized vision of the morality of work. Now, central to that racialized vision was the juxtaposing of two racialized body types. And between these two body types, the entire world of bodies and labor would be judged, gauged, and articulated. There was the white body, the imagined white body, the civilized, honorable, beautiful prototype. And there was the non-white body, most centrally the black body, the uncivilized, primitive, dangerous, and ugly body. We understand this. This latter body was the body, this latter body was the body in its raw condition of unproductivity. Its raw condition of unproductivity. Like the new world itself, raw, unproductive, has not been formed to yield its fruit. Labor meant very different things calibrated through racialized bodies. In short, in short, the labor of white workers revealed their honor. The honor inherent to the white body. The labor of black workers and all those whose bodies were associated with the black body proved, proved that they were worthy of honor. And through working, they were moving away from the primitive and unproductive state of that body. That is, the black worker held at bay dishonor by their work. From factory floors to playing fields, from shops and corner stores to corporate offices, Non-white workers work to prove their honor. The work of white workers simply reveals their honor. So labor has been framed inside a movement toward a morality bound up in whiteness, which means there has always been a double burden for people without work shaped in this vision both the burden of a lack of income, but also the burden of a lack of honor. When spe people speak of work and honor, there are two different conversations going on. These three imagined transformations, from raw material to owner, from stranger to citizen, and from being identified with darkness to being seen as honorably white in one's labor, gave material content, material content to the goal of maturity for so many and gave us a vision of growth disconnected from the land. Which brings us back to what I mentioned to you yesterday, the geographic wound. Because this vision of growth and maturity has bequeathed to us two more effects of the geographic wound. As noted yesterday in our first lecture, the geographic wound distorted the way we see the world and read scripture. We spoke about that last night. So sorry, my, I thought I cut my phone off this way. Excuse me. Now we must add to this distortion Distortions in how we think place 
and how we relate to the world, how we think place and how we relate to the world. First place. Place has been made inconsequential in us and to us. Place has been made utterly inconsequential in us and to us. This, my sisters and brothers, it's a wound. It's a terrible wound. You see, the colonialist way of seeing framed the whole world temporally, temporally always in need of being moved from its potential to its full realization, from potentiality to actuality, as the Thomist would say. This way of perceiving the world, as the great Native American religious scholar Vine Deloria Jr. reminded us, drained the world, drained the spatial realities of life of any real significance drained the spatial realities of life of any real significance. Native peoples, he said, were forced to think their lives temporally and not spatially. The Western Christianity they received taught them this crucial lesson. Where you were temporally, that is, where you were going, moving, and developing toward, was far more important than where you were spatially, that is, where you live, where you live now, or with what people, animals, plants, landscape, you shared habitation. In fact, he said, the latter is so inconsequential that you may see it if you wish, and you may ignore it if you have more important things to do. What Vine Deloria Jr. was pointing toward was the historic problem of a faith offered to indigenous peoples that told them that time was far more important to God than space, than place. Time was far more important to God than place. After all, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth it was told to them. It was, it was and is a faith that believes strongly in the time of salvation, but has never understood the space of salvation. We do not yet understand the redemption of place. Space and place matter to God. Space and place matter to God. The tragedy we inhabit is that our visions of discipleship, its reach, its quality, its character are all controlled by a geographic imagination that does not know or sense or understand place as a site of God's desire. But not only has place been rendered inconsequential, but secondly, as I said, the world, the world has been rendered one-dimensional. This is also a wound. The world has been rendered one-dimensional. The pedagogical goal of missionaries and others was not simply to bring New World's peoples into the reality of salvation but as fundamental to that salvation to change their way of seeing the world so that they too would see themselves rightly, to see themselves rightly as centered selves who project meaning onto the world and who may bring nature to its full purpose and use. The relationship with the world offered to countless peoples was basically one dimensional. We interpret and manipulate the world as we see fit, taking from it what we need and caring for it only within the logics of making it more productive for us. Why else do you care for it? There's no other reason to care for it. That is, we draw the world to its proper fulfillment to take care of us. This is crudely put, 
but it captures the trajectory of how humanity's imperial position as stewards of the creation was most often interpreted in Christian colonial context. This tragedy has grown over the century, giving birth to the unrelenting logics of development and extraction, as I said last night. People all over the world, all over the world, have been taught to read their places, see their animals, and understand the ground, all as commodity and potential, all as subject to development and extraction. Equally important, they have been taught to calibrate their growth and their maturity to the only site of maturity that matters, global markets, and abandon visions of maturity bound to place and life together with the land. The self that emerged from this new vision of maturity, global maturity if you like, is an enclosed self, one whose horizons are always focused on bringing nature and human life to a mature usefulness to the market. So we must return to the question, as I get ready to close, we must return to the question, what does maturity look like? Maturity of mind and body, land and animal use, landscape and building, family and life together. You see, we Christians have an answer to that question that we have never truly entered because since the beginning of the colonial moment, we lost ourselves to the trajectories of transformation, of development and abstraction, all aiming at ownership, ownership signified by mastery and control and possession. We lost sight of where growth comes from. We lost sight of who gives growth. And we lost sight of what growth means. Remember 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul planted. Paul is water. But the rest is very simple, very simple. The rest is very simple. God gives growth. I must tell you this story very quickly about my dear mother who was a very serious woman of the earth, very serious gardener. Every spring, my mother would get her garden ready, get her garden ready, and she would come outside. It was a nice little patch of, of earth, too much for as far as concerned, because I had to work it with her. But it was a nice little patch of earth, and she would clear away, she would clear away all the, the debris, and she would get the ground fully wet, and it would be this rich, black Michigan dirt. Those of you who have been from Michigan, you know that's the best dirt. The best dirt. Rich, black Michigan dirt. Ooh, still has a little chill in it, even in the, in the summer. So, and she would, and you know, my mother was, was from the old school, she never wore pants, you know, she wore a dress, so she was out there in a dress. And she would be out there in the middle of her, in the middle of her patch of dirt, and she'd be on her knees She'd stick her hands, my mom, my mom had thick hands from all those years of picking cotton. Thick, strong hands from picking cotton. And she would put her hands into the dirt and she said, Willie, come here, boy, come here. So, oh, mama. <laughs> and so I, would, well, I, had to, I knew what she wanted. I had to walk out there next to her. And she said, get out here next to me. Stick your hand in this dirt. Stick your hand in there. And she would make me stick my hand all the way above my elbow into the dirt. She would look at me and say, you feel that? You feel that? And I would say, yes, mama. <laughs> She'd say, that's life, boy. That's life, boy. I'd say, yes, mama. <laughs> say, oh, boy, go over, there, go over there and give me my seat. Bring me my seat over here. And I'll pull my hands out of that dirt. And I would bring her, go get her seed. And I would bring the seed to her. And I was bringing the seed to a woman who had made this dirt her own. Had made it her own. You see, growth comes 
from the ground. Listen very carefully. Growth comes from the ground. The future comes from the ground up. Our eschatologies are so messed up because we think growth comes horizontally from the future to us. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. The future always comes up from the ground. Jesus said that, plant the mustard seed. Plant the mustard seed. The future comes up from the ground. The future, our growth, is fundamentally calibrated by the earth. From the rain that falls to the plants that grow, from the waters that flow across the earth. And in Jesus, the ground has been embraced by its creator. The ground that gives growth has been freshly, claimed freshly by the God who gives life to the ground. Now we, we can see this, we can see this from the baptismal waters of Jesus. From his baptism, Jesus takes hold of the water. We have to think about his baptism differently, my friends. Remember, what my, remember my mother, now you have to think about his baptism differently. When he entered the water, he was drawing it back to its creator. The giver of life now holds the waters of life. And now from the waters that he has seized, made the waters his own, from the waters he has seized, become for us the womb of Jesus, which is also the womb of God in which we are born anew. Maybe this is a good way to think of this. Follow me. When Jesus came out of the water, he emerged with a womb. Yeah. Stay with me. Yeah, yeah. Preach this on a Sunday. Yeah. He, when he came out of the water, he emerged with a womb. And from there, we would be born anew. He is the one who gives life from the sight of life, from the waters, and he will by the Spirit draw us into the womb of God to be born anew. Now wind and water speak of God's claiming of God's love creation. Think of John chapter 3, verses 1 through 12 here. Verse 6, no one can enter the basileia of God without being born, being born of water and spirit. The womb is speaking. The womb. This is the taking back of life in its contingency by the creator. This is the redirecting of life trajectories, life stories. This is the new determination being brought to all forms of definition, biological, familial, clan, cult, nation, association. We must be born anew, born again, born from the waters of baptism. Life begins at baptism. So from Jesus' baptism, his ministry begins, his destiny and his identity are made known. This is where we enter his life, his destiny, his identity. The disciples we baptize with his baptism. This is always his baptism. A world is dying and being born in his baptism. This is where life begins for us. But where does it go, Dr. Jen? Where does it go? I'm so glad you asked me that. Where does it go? Life with God is the goal of life. Life with God is the goal of life. This is a crucial point we've forgotten. Jesus binds his disciples by the Spirit to his own body. Where he goes, they will go. In a sense, they will, live, they will live on pilgrimage with Jesus. Not only going from place to place, wherever the Spirit leads, but also moving always more deeply into Jesus' life. And there at the surface, at the center, and at the end of his life, there at the surface, at the center, and at the end of his life, is only one thing, the eating. The eating. 
the goal of it all is to eat, to live with God and eat, to thrive together with one another and eat. The goal of it all is the eating. Jesus is always binding his disciples to his life so that they will live in the demand to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Think of the passage you all know by heart, I'm sure. John chapter 6, verse 48 and following. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews dispute among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You remember this? Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. As you all know, this is an astounding text. Who could have ever anticipated that Jesus would say this to the children of Israel and all those others listening, those Gentiles listening. It is as though the Spirit of God has driven him to this truth of the intimacy that has shaped his life. This is the fundamental signature of what I call the revolution of the intimate. God will wait no longer. God will offer to the creature God's own body. Maybe Maybe the pulling and the pleading. Maybe the screaming and crying of the crowd desperate for help brought Jesus to this realization. I mean, how did, how did he come to the realization that he must, he must give, him, give his body to them? Maybe their constant pulling at him brought him to the realization that he must give his body body to them. They can only be helped and healed if they take his whole body into themselves. Only if he turns his body into the very reality of the earth. Only if like the earth, like plants. Only if he becomes exactly the earth. Only that. Only, only that way. Could he give himself to them all? Maybe they were screaming after him, and he looked and saw, saw the plants and realized, I have to become just like this. I have to become food. I have to become one with the very earth and give myself just like I was bread, just like I was water. This this will be the intimacy. This will be the intimacy within which all forms of intimacy will find their logic and their redemption. This will be the intimacy that defines all others. The body of God joined to our bodies. You can't get more intimate than that. The body of God encircling bread and wine forever. The nourishment we need for life and for life eternal. This is the place from which we must begin to understand intimacy and most importantly, sisters and brothers, maturity. We live always from the baptism of Jesus toward the eating of his flesh and blood. Always from Life in the water to life eating the God who has made God's self one with the ground. We live from baptism to the Lord's Supper. All of life is lived between these two realities, always moving from the one to the other, from the one to the other, always remembering our life from the water and the spirit and joining 
being joined to the divine life in and through the body, the body and blood of Jesus. This is the true pilgrimage of life in and through the creation. In and through the creation, the eating and the drinking are both present reality and our destiny. The quality and character of all cultivation, the quality and character of all cultivation for us as Christians flows out of this pilgrimage, this movement from baptism to the eating of the body of Jesus. This means for us that maturity of mind and body, of land and animal, of landscape and building, of family and life together will move against the trajectories of transformation and racial formation that characterize our lives. We need at this moment a Christian faith that can start to break our deep connection to whiteness by resisting its vision of maturity. We must give witness to a vision of maturity that binds us to the earth and to one another in the eating, in the living of life together, in the eating, in the living of life together. Maturity for us means a life in which all of us eat together. Any other definition of maturity is a waste of time. <laughs> the paths that have been formed by whiteness, carved on the earth and in bodies cannot be un undone, but they can be redirected, drawn into new paths that lead away from death and into life. It all begins, my sisters and brothers, with the land with dirt, with water, cities, towns, neighborhoods, and homes. It begins with new kinds of intentional communities that challenge where people live and how people live in places. Now, as I close, I'm doubling down on what some people know and feel but are afraid to say, so I'll say it. It all comes to rest in geography, and living spaces. Whiteness, whiteness comes to rest in space. Listen very carefully. Whiteness comes to rest in space. The maturity whiteness aims at always forms segregated spaces. Always. Always forms segregated spaces. It forms lives lived in parallel, whether separated by miles or inches. It constructs bordered life, life lived in separate endeavors of wish fulfillment. So in our next lecture, we'll begin to rethink what mature life lived in the land and life lived together looks like by rethinking the line. Rethinking the line by rethinking borders, and boundaries. So by way of summary, in this lecture we considered how our hermeneutics of possession has distorted the way we understand cultivation and has given birth to a horrific vision of maturity bound to whiteness. It has promoted a vision of maturity centered around three forms of, de of desire transformation, from raw material to ownership, from stranger to citizen, and from darkness to honorably white. Our visions of maturity have deepened our geographic wound by rendering place inconsequential to us and reducing our relation to the world to one dimension, found only in use. We who follow Jesus and his way with the land are called to a different life together in him and with him living always from baptism to eating his life together. Thank you very much.